All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for what everyone should know. Uh, we're very excited to connect with everyone. We hope everyone had a safe day today. There was some uh, interesting weather going on um, in all the areas that we have participants from on the East Coast, I guess I should say. So I just want to say hi. My name's Lori Watkin, and I work for the Sarah Play family of companies. And I'm responsible for community education. And I wanted to introduce our panel of experts. We have three presenters and actually one additional expert that will be available for questions during and at the end of the presentation. So I'd first like to introduce Lisa Vitelli. Um, she is an occupational therapist with TheraPlay and began her career in the mental health field where she eventually served in a management position in a research hospital setting. Since 1990, Lisa's been practicing in a wide variety of pediatric settings, including early intervention, school age services, evaluation teams, grant-funded occupational therapy, private sensory integration therapy, and outpatient pediatrics. Therapy settings. Lisa highly values provision of quality therapy services to children and their families. She's committed to ensuring that high quality services are provided across the entire contract services division of the TheraPlay family of companies. And then next we have Pat Bergmeier, who is with 1847 Financial. Pat's a certified financial planner and has a passion for working with families. His knowledge and expertise allows him to develop comprehensive and holistic financial plans for his children that provide the framework for making financial decisions that will help achieve their lifetime and legacy planning goals. Pat's also a chartered special needs consultant. This designation has provided Pat with the knowledge to address the unique circumstances and requirements of planning for individuals with special needs, which is the core focus of his practice. He began his career in the financial service industries in 2005, and prior to joining 1847, he was partnered with the MetLife Center for Special Needs Planning, where his passion for working with the special needs community began. He's involved also in supporting many special needs organizations such as Ascend, um, Autism Cares, the Down Syndrome Interest Groups, and Plan of PA. He sits on the advisory, advisory board of the American College Center for Special Needs. And then our last presenter that we have with us is John Truitt, who is a BCPA with Continuum Behavioral Health. John is a board-certified behavioral analyst working primarily in Loudoun County, Virginia. I forgot to mention that we have experts from all over Pennsylvania and Virginia. A DC area native, John grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, and currently lives in Loudoun County, Virginia. Holds a Master of Science in Criminal Justice with a focus on behavioral analysis from St. Joe's and a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Salisbury University. After completing graduate school, John completed his clinical training with Optimal Beginnings and became a BCBA in 2014. Over the course of his career, John has worked with clients raising, ranging in the age from two to 21. While versed in all areas of ABA, John regularly finds himself drawn to the topics of social skills and communication as he believes that increasing fluency in these areas can and does lead to improvements in all areas of life. As such, John believes in a team approach to ABA, including parents, siblings, teachers, and others whose interactions may help shape a person's success. And these are our presenters for the evening, but speaking of teachers, we also have on our panel of experts, Jordan Feinberg, who is a special education teacher uh, with a huge passion for the children that she treats, and she is actually from the western part of the state, from the Pittsburgh area, so we're hoping that Jordan didn't get hit as badly as we did with the storm on the east coast. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Um, feel free to send in any questions that you have during the presentation. We'll try to address them as best as we can. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'm glad to be with you all this evening. And I'm going to be talking this evening about uh, the differences between uh, three models of service delivery. Uh, the first being early intervention for the birth to three population. So the early intervention infant toddler program supports children with developmental disabilities or delays from the ages of birth to three, and they provide support and services to those children and their families or their caregivers. Um, and the, I was going to give you some info. I'm going to give you some information about um, how the process works very quickly. Um, so to become eligible for early intervention, there's a multidisciplinary evaluation team that would come out to a child's natural environment, most likely their home, and assess uh, for eligibility to determine if there's delays in one or more areas. And those delays would be determined by using standardized tests with norms and looking at the areas of physical skills, such as reaching, crawling, walking, building, uh, cognitive skills, such as thinking, learning, and problem solving, communication skills, talking and listening and understanding, self-help or adaptive skills like eating or dressing, and then the social emotional skills, playing, interacting with others. So if a child has a delay in one or more of these areas, or they would qualify for early intervention, and you see on the slides, there's different criteria, though it's very, very similar across the states. So most generally, it's a 25% delay in one or more area. The child also, though, may have a specific health condition that would um, be likely would likely lead to a delay in the future, and that would also qualify them. So, an example, some examples would be autism spectrum disorder or failure to thrive, Down syndrome, a visual disability, fetal alcohol syndrome, just to name a few. Once the eligibility is determined, an IFSP is the an IFSP is an individualized family service plan, and What's unique about this model and why I actually love it very much as an occupational therapist is because it's family driven. What, when, when we talk about goals later in the educational model, model or goals in the medical model, this is an outcome developed by the family. So what's important to the family is what the team will work on. And once that outcome is, is determined, then it is determined what services can support that outcome. The other unique the piece of early intervention for the birth to three is that it's a routines-based model. So all intervention occurs within routines. It's completely family-centered. It occurs in the natural environment, like the um, in the community or the home or a child's daycare or preschool. The model is also a coaching model. So we coach all caregivers. That would be the babysitter that takes care of a child to the grandparent to um, a foster parent. We use materials that are natural within the environment, and it's all about coaching that caregiver so that those materials that you would use in, in a session would be able to be used all throughout the week. Other than Delaware, um, families can access both early intervention and other therapy um, through the medical model. And in Pennsylvania and Delaware, there's no cost to the family, where in New Jersey and Virginia, the, the family shares the cost. Now, right now with COVID, the, the model we're using is mostly through tele-intervention. Um, some face-to-face -face going on, but right now, because of the COVID situation, we are providing birth to three, mostly in, through tele-intervention. And what's been really interesting as we've transitioned our therapy world to this, this virtual platform is that the coaching model has really landed quite nicely and been very conducive to the tele-intervention. Because if you think about it, if you're a, an interventionist at a home, you're really coaching a family member, kind of from a distance at times. And so that, that virtual platform has really lended nicely to that. Moving on to the intermediate unit, school, preschool, uh, school age services. Just trying to forward my slide. It's stalled. Um, 
Well, while we're forwarding it, I'll just keep talking. Um, similar criteria for, thank you very much, similar criteria regarding that 25% delay we spoke about in one or more area would um, qualify a child for this service in school age or early intervention three to five. So three to five preschool services are also in the early intervention um, domain. So would have to have a 25% delay in one or more areas or a physical or mental disability. And some examples would be autism, emotional disturbance, neurological impairments, um, deaf or hearing loss, learning disabilities, blindness, and intellectual disabilities, just to name a few. In addition, though, a student would need to be in need of special education. So the difference between birth to three early intervention, which is that family uh, and routines related, is all about a child's ability to access their education as a student. And where in birth to three, there's an IFSP, in this model, there's an IEP, or an individualized education plan. And all goals, and I notice I'm using the word goals versus outcomes, all goals are related to education. There is no cost to families. Um, and you'll notice on the slide that the evaluation time is um, varies, but you know, within 30 days. So when you ask for a referral, I mean, when you ask request an evaluation, it can take up to 60 days in Pennsylvania for an evaluation, up to 90 in Delaware and Jersey, and up to 65 in Virginia. But similarly, there's really no differences across the states as far as the model. It is completely educationally based. And then finally, the accessing therapy services in that outpatient or medical model, the evaluation completion time is, it can be scheduled within a pretty short time frame. So it really depends on where you're calling as far as if they have a waiting list or not but it's not something similar where, where there's a process of a certain waiting period as, or a certain time period as there are in early intervention and school age. Um, the qualification is based completely on a medical or developmental condition. And the goal is to order, and the goal is to gain and restore function. And the service model is completely medically based. Um, and the cost really does vary depending on insurance plans. Um, I know for TheraPlay, we do verifications prior to the evaluation and our company accepts almost um, most major insurances. What we, what we have noticed through the years is that um, a lot of these services complement each other very well. So um, it's oftentimes children are receiving services in school and also receiving supplemental or primary medical services in an outpatient setting. So in Pennsylvania, you can access medical school and early intervention simultaneously. In Delaware, you can access medical and school because you cannot have both medical and early intervention at the same time. And in New Jersey, you can access medical and school services simultaneously, as well as in Virginia, including early intervention. And Lisa, we did have one question. Sure. Um, someone was wondering what do, or how does teletherapy work when a child is attending childcare? Great question. So be, it's interesting that all of the uh, rules and regulations right now are about safety. So if that daycare um, is allowing people from the outside to come in and they meet right now, at least I can speak for the eight counties that we're in, right now in Pennsylvania, the tele-intervention is the preference and it must be a, a significant need and must be determined for face-to-face. -face. So for tele-intervention in a daycare, you would have to have it would have to be um, organized for the family and the daycare that someone would be able to uh, be present in like a Zoom meeting. And that is a lot more complicated in daycares. We're not having that many sessions, I'll be honest, at this time. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, except that if it's a, if it's a daycare program where, for example, uh, a teacher or an aide or an assistant teacher can be pulled aside for even a half hour of an hour session just to do that face to, that intervention through telehealth, telehealth, it would be beneficial. Great, thank you. Okay. And Laurie, is this something that, um, 
that you'd be able to speak to about insurance and reimbursement for outpatient? Um, yeah, so um, if as I can speak to our outpatient services, if a family um, reaches out to our outpatient facilities, um, we will take all of their insurance information and verify up front exactly what the coverage um, includes, um, depending whether it's commercial insurance or uh, medical assistance or a combination thereof. Um, it, it does vary by state to state what contracts we have with commercial and medical assistance plans, but we verify that all up front for the family before they would actually come in, and then we strongly encourage them to also go through the same verification process with their um, insurance carriers. Great. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. You're good. Okay, cool. Um, so moving on and sort of, you know, giving some new information as well as adding on to some of the things that Lisa said, um, starting with the telehealth option right there, uh, since that was the, the last topic that was mentioned, we've been engaged in some form of telehealth for several years at this point um obviously as all of you i'm sure are aware um you know in the past it was not an area that was as greatly explored um sort of across the board but recent events have made it something that uh you know obviously is being explored a lot more in depth for a lot more practical applications um so what we're seeing now is that having become a very excellent tool for providers for a variety of different services, um, types of services that I'll get to in a moment. Um, definitely allows flexibility of scheduling with staff, parents, um, and with children. Um, you know, children, while they're available during the day right now, um, not being in school full time in a lot of areas, um, from a staff perspective, we can take out the element of having to uh, drive between various places to provide in-home service. Um, you know, we can we can have meetings or therapy sessions back to back. Um, and for parents, um, you know, if if we're doing team meetings or parent consultations or trainings or things of that nature, it does provide that option for a working parent to log on and have a meeting with me or one of my colleagues sometimes, you know, over their lunch break in the middle of the day or, or something such as that, um, which is something that we've been doing for a number of years. Um, just with working parents, there's not always all that much time in the evening to do a, a parent training or a consultation meeting or something of that nature, whereas there may be an hour in the middle of the day that we could log into Zoom or whatever the preferred method is and have that meeting. Um, so the ABA team at Continuum thus far, we has been able to conduct almost all of our types of appointments via telehealth. Um, you know, regular ABA sessions, parent consultation, social skills groups, everything like that just trying to get creative in how to how to fit that type of therapy into the telehealth model. Um, and it's it's opened our eyes quite a bit, along with the way that we had been doing things in the past, to future ways that we can integrate that into a model um, that you know maybe we hadn't even visited before, but now because of COVID, we've had to visit and realized, hey, this this really works. There's something there. Um, but one thing that I will caution that we have found out is not all insurance companies cover telehealth. Um, some do for certain insurance codes, certain types of service. Um, some do for all, some do for none. So that's something that we're having to do on a case-by-case -case basis as of this moment. 
in terms of dealing with the insurance carrier for determining what benefits the, the particular family has. Um, now we're hoping, I'm hoping I should say, that in the future the insurance companies also see the benefit of the telehealth option and begin to add that more as an option that we can explore in depth down the road. Um, as of right now, that's not firmly in place. That's just me being very hopeful about a possible future situation there. Um, so moving on, oh, my slides, my slides not going. Um, Lauren, I think we skipped my first slide, the types of services slide. Since I moved to the second one. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on now since you know, since I mentioned the telehealth option and the types of services that we've been able to do with that, um, these are our general services with Continuum that we work with. We're primarily an autism services company. Um, you know, one of our the names that we've been known by is Autism Spectrum Alliance. Um, and a lot of what we do revolves around that type of treatment. Um, so we do have offices around the country. Um, our headquarters is in McLean, Virginia, Fairfax County. We also have some operations in Colorado, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, um, several other places that I'm not remembering off the top of my head because there's too many. Um, but one of the, the things that we already had in place was a telehealth option for consultation um, to do parent meetings, parent training, different things of that nature, as well as therapy that could be done remotely um, that we've been working with for several years. But the primary types of service that we're working on, you know, I, I would say that we're seeing on a daily basis. Um, functional behavioral assessment, um, BIPs, um, programming and treatment for behavior reduction, um, all of them sort of falling under an ABA category. We're using ABA methodology in majority of these. Um, skill acquisition programming, often using a differential reinforcement model um, where you know, for a behavior intervention plan, we're not just saying, don't do this we're we're teaching a do this instead type of model in terms of proactive skill acquisition uh rather than just telling a you know approaching it as how can we get this child to stop having tantrums we look at why is the child having tantrums and how can we address that need and that's what this is designed around um social skills groups uh which we've been able to do uh with great effectiveness via telehealth. And uh, Lori and Lauren have the, the information on those on the different age levels and types that we've done. Uh, everything from you know teen peer groups, getting to know each other, learning uh, you know, appropriate conversation to executive functioning groups, things of that nature. Um, and like I said, Lori and Lauren have all of that information. If you're interested in it, we'll be able to get that to you. Um, IEP consultation, we're not advocates, we're not lawyers, but I've been to more IEP meetings that I can count. Um, and in working with these kids, working with these families, we get to know them very well and you know, able to provide a voice to, to assist the families, not only help families eliminate some anxiety, alleviate some anxiety, but also see that child in a perspective that maybe teachers haven't seen them before. Um, a big aspect of what we do is the parent and caregiver training. Anybody that's been involved with an ABA program uh, knows that a lot of insurance providers require that, um, that it at least be built into the program. Um, so we, we try to do that as much as possible and are, are working to constantly update and develop a curriculum for families on that. Uh, 
And uh, I know Lisa mentioned that as well uh, in what she was talking about. Obviously, from, from a professional standpoint there, the more that we can get caregivers and other providers involved, the better off we'll be because we'll all be speaking the same language. We'll all be working on the same things rather than stepping on toes. Um, collaboration with other professionals falling into that exact same category. Um, if there's a if a child's receiving, um, you know, program through school, special education program, and speech therapy, and occupational therapy, and ABA therapy, in my opinion, it doesn't work for all of us to be out pulling on our own, out doing all of those things on our own. The best service that we can provide to that family, to that child, to that person, is for all of us to be working together as much as possible, obviously with the family as a clearinghouse for you know, privacy and, and HIPAA and the, those types of very, very vital, important things. But that sharing of information ensures that the best service is being provided across the board. Um, and then also in some of our uh, locations, we have speech and language available. Um, not necessarily in every location around the country, but those consultations available. Um, and while all of these work together very well, um, and in a perfect world, um, everybody that we work with would have access to all of these right away as much as they need. Some of these can be done on a, uh, I don't, case by case basis or pick and choose almost, um, where we can just do parent and caregiver training if that's all a family really needs. Um, you know, we have families that just sign up for our social skills groups because, you know, they may have ADA through another provider that doesn't offer social skills. Um, so these are available to anyone, not just you know, existing clients. And we try to work with anybody that needs those services as much as possible. Um, and now I will. John, we actually have two questions for you. Okay, go for uh, it. The first is how long is the average ABA teletherapy session? Um, average ABA therapy session, uh, I always put in air quotes a little bit because it depends on um, the ability of the child to sustain attending for that long. Right now, what I have going is for the for the younger kids or the more severely impacted uh, kids that we work with, um, the type whose parents need to be right there with them 100% of the time, we're doing about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, for some of the, the older kids that may have the ability to attend for significantly longer and work more independently, that's where I'm getting more into the two hour ish time. Those are less that that's lower than the average in person time, uh, obviously. Um, but that's about where we're at right now. In person will be significantly longer for both of them. Okay. And then um, we had someone who asked, how do you determine which services a child would need? I'm not sure which of these would be what my son would need. The first thing that we do, um, well, the, the first thing that we do clinically, uh, I don't wanna speak to our administrative staff and have them think I'm jumping over them. The first thing that we'll do clinically is an intake meeting with the parent or parents of the child where we will sit down for an hour or two and just talk about you know, what, what is the diagnosis? What has been going on in the child's life? What are your concerns? What are your goals? and really try to get a feel for that, the, the family situation um, in that regard. And actually, Lauren, if you can go to my third slide, um, it gives a little bit more information right on this, uh, on this topic. Um, so right here on day one, you can see there's the intake meeting where uh, a BCBA um, or you know, uh, another clinical leader such as myself we'll sit with the family and that's what I just talked about where we will talk about anything that needs to be talked about in that regard to get background information. 
there. Um, but then it doesn't end there. We will go through coming to your house or meeting you in public or you know, right now doing something online on Zoom, uh, whatever is available to do an observation so that we can see your family, see your child, interact, um, and then you know start to gather some hard data uh, whether it's a, a formal assessment such as the, the functional assessment of functional living skills um, or you know the, the VB map or the PDDBI, some of them depend on the insurance provider what they require um, to get a formal assessment in place. Um, informal assessments such as gathering some baseline data of behaviors, things like that. And really what you can see here on this one um, days one through 10 are all about just getting notes, getting data, um, getting as much information sharing uh, about the child and with the family as possible before we'll even think about making a recommendation. Um, and then at that point, then we will begin the discussion of, okay, let's talk about what we want to ask the insurance company for. Did that answer the question? Yes, that's great, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, and then moving on from there in the process a little bit, um, like I said, up through day 10, that's all meeting, data collection, assessments, things like that. Uh, at around day 10 to 14 after we've first met you, then we'll start working with the insurance carrier to, to say, Here's what we believe is necessary. Uh, please pay for it, essentially, for, for lack of a better term there. Um, submit all of the paperwork to them. Hopefully get a reasonably quick turnaround so that we can um, move forward. Now, days 10 through 30, you can see here in the middle, are often spent in that regard. Moving forward, we'll start services. What we often do is not begin with um, a full slate right away. Um, so let's say we determine that 15 hours a week of ABA service is appropriate. We're not going to come right out of the gate with 15 hours a week um, on that one. That just, for many people, that's way too overwhelming. So what we'll often start off with is some time of just family consultation and then start off slow and do a gradual buildup. Um, you know, the same way, you know, you, you wouldn't go to the gym for three hours a day every day after your New Year's resolution. We don't start the ABA service at three hours a day every day or whatever the case may be um, and end up overwhelming the child and overwhelming the family. It will be a gradual buildup from there. So all told from first meeting until being at full speed in therapy could be could be a few months to being at full speed, but it's all a buildup to make sure that we're we're doing it right, not right now, to use the term that I put on here. And John, we do have one other question for you. Okay. Um, our services is our services provided from an RBT, or does the BCBA do that? If it is the RBT, approximately how often does the BCBA attend a session? Uh, the services majority are provided by an RBT. Now, speaking as a, a BCBA supervisor, I try, I try to conduct my own sessions somewhat frequently as well. Um, I'm of the belief that if I'm, if I'm to provide feedback to RBTs on how to conduct therapy, uh, I believe I should be able to do it well and be up to practice with it myself. Um, that said, the RBTs are the primary people, and then I will fill in uh, fill in gaps to get an additional day with clients or things of that nature. Um, so I guess the correct, the simple answer to your question is both. Um, in terms of how often will the BCBA be there, insurance companies will generally allow, well, it depends on the, the company, but they'll generally allow that 10 to 15% of the direct service 
be supervised or directed by a BCBA with an RBT there. I may not be exactly correct on that one. Fortunately, I have an insurance specialist that handles all of that for me. Mm -hmm. um, but generally that will be the approximate number. So if a child is receiving 15 hours of therapy, well, let's make it simple. If a child's receiving 10 hours of therapy per week, you can generally expect there to average between an hour, an hour to two hours per week of direct supervision by a BCBA. Um, not, not to say oh, it will always be a BCBA will show up for one hour once every week. Some days it'll be you know, two and a half hours every other week, um, but that's generally approximately what it will be. Great, thank you. All right, so I am not going to try to make everybody an expert in special needs financial planning in the time we have. Uh, I hope to kind of summarize, get you guys some takeaways from tonight, uh, and then let you know that I am available for one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings. That would be nationwide across the country, too, if it's me or somebody on my team. Uh, to talk about what might be pertinent to you, because um, honestly, there's no cookie cutter approach to this. There's no manual to follow. I think the most important thing to understand with this type of planning is the focal point of this is your loved one with a disability. And we need to make sure that that individual that may not have a voice at the table when decisions are made on his or her behalf, that their quality of life and their lifetime care is maintained. So uh, that's what I found 10 years ago when I transitioned my practice into this. And about 90% of my partner and I, our business, uh, is working with families that have loved ones with disabilities. And what I found is the parents have a resonating similar goal is they, they make sure that their loved one's taken care of with, whether or not if they're here uh, or when they're gone. Part of that uh, goes along with protecting benefits, which are so confusing. Uh, I'm going to very, be very high level on benefits tonight because you could honestly have a whole presentation focused on that. Uh, talk about uh, some of the other important areas as well and the mistakes that also go go along with uh, these important goals. So if you can move to the next slide, uh, for some reason my click is not working there. Uh, but I'll, I'll share with you the mistakes that are made in, in this type of planning. Um, they're usually very similar uh, and they all kind of go together, but we just have the, the wrong advisors. We have the wrong team of people that are working and uh, the important areas of this planning, if you, if you can break it into three, legal, financial, and government benefits and care management, is we have people approaching this type of planning like you're similar to everybody else, your age or in your socioeconomic class. It's, it can't be done that way. Everything has to be tailored in special needs planning, and you honestly do have to work with somebody that knows what the heck he or she is doing. I've seen way too many mistakes uh, by attorneys that aren't experts in special needs state law. Uh, investment advisors, insurance agents that don't understand special needs planning, uh, and you can miss a lot. And unfortunately, those gaps sometimes don't present themselves until it's too late, and uh, we can't afford to do that when it comes to special needs planning. Um, procrastination. Uh, procrastination goes along with uh, lack of planning or, hey, my, my kid's young, I don't need to do this, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, they're not disabled, they're going to go to college. All of these things um, are great. We want to focus on what we hope is the most positive outcome for our loved ones and plan for the best, expect the best. But if we don't have a backup plan for all of this, you could, you could be talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that could have otherwise stayed in your family that now Uncle Sam is the first in line to get that uh, rather than your family members or whatever charitable causes are close to yours. So doing this planning, though, is does not mean that you, your child is going to be permanently disabled or even need government benefits or not go to college or not be gainfully employed. It's your worst case scenario plan. It's, it's honestly, if all those good things don't come to fruition, I have to have a fallback of what the government can provide in the, in the world of eligibility and entitlement benefits. And, you know, the, the plans that are collecting dust, or for those of you that haven't started this, uh, you throw having a child with special needs and IEPs or ISPs and, you know, work and other children, uh, your life is busy. Your, your plates are full. You always have stuff to do. And then throw a pandemic on top of that and now trying to be a special education teacher at home. I can understand where the, the finding time to do this stuff that you probably already know is important, but making time to do it 
uh, gets lost in the mix. But honestly, people ask me, when do I need to do this? I, I heard it's at 18 or 21 or 26. And all kidding aside, it's literally one day before you die. If you do this planning proactively, your child's going to be taken care of. If you do not, it is honestly going to be a mess, a an emotional, a financial mess for the people that you leave behind. And that's why you need to do it. You can't expect the school district to be there for you or the government to be there for you always. It really falls on your shoulders as parents to take a proactive role and approach this planning, uh, not only the way you need to, the way you, that your kids deserve, you to, uh, deserve of you. So uh, you can go to the next slide now uh, as well. So uh, in my opinion, and then uh, I'm going to try to leave plenty of room for questions and answers. I'm going to stick here and touch on what I think are the most important aspects of planning. These three areas, in my opinion, all equally important. Whatever reason in the special needs community, they are not given equal weight, which is why you see a lot of people go to the attorney first, which is the legal side. And I'm not an attorney. I don't do what they do. They definitely do not do what I do. So you need synergy amongst these two uh, advisors on your team that they complement one another. Uh, the, the most important legal document that everybody that has a child with special needs needs to have is a special needs trust. Um, I don't care what you've been told by other people or what you've read online. A special needs trust is the only way and the most efficient way to protect benefit eligibility and leave enough money to take care of your child and give them the quality of life that you want for them. Um, and not to dumb down what these attorneys do because it is a very high level of legal work. But when you when you meet with an attorney, what he or she is doing for you is drafting legal documents, stacks of paper. Those stacks of paper written the right way, written very well, will protect benefit eligibility because the special needs trust uh, can have millions of dollars in it and benefits aren't jeopardized. But creating a special needs trust does not mean your kid's going to be taken care of. It's documents. It's paperwork. Paperwork's not going to take care of the child. That's why you need the world of government benefits to complement the work you do with the attorney and you better have your financial ducks in a row or all you're going to have at the end of the day when you die or in retirement when you're running out of money is a fancy set of legal paperwork that is never going to do what it's intended to do which is take care of your child so the attorney is going to do your basic documents wills medical and financial powers of attorney everybody needs those as well special needs situation or not we owe it to our children to name who their guardian is going to be and we want to make sure that we have documentation in place to allow somebody to make decisions on our behalf if we're incapacitated so legal planning is extremely important government benefits needs-based benefits versus entitlement they're confusing even if you work for uh in the special needs community they still probably confuse you so there's tons of acronyms you need to know they confuse they, they sound the same but they're different um, the key thing with government benefits and, you know, this, there are higher dollar limits for other benefits, but if you can keep $2,000 in, in your brain at all times, that is the maximum amount of aggregate resources your loved one can have before they're going to lose eligibility for needs-based government benefits. So um, what can't you do? You can't invest, save, or put money in their name, in their social security number, which means nobody else can either. So the way, and I'm not saying you don't save for your child, you just don't save in their name. You need to save in the right way, in a way that makes sense. Um, so we not only want to get benefits, we want to maximize them. We buy, by all means want to protect them because once we get them, we don't want to lose them. But we need to understand how they work, how election of Social Security, when to take our retirement benefits, very different when you have a child with special needs. What happens at age 18? What happens at age 21 or 26? These are all the important ages that um, honestly, I, I can promise you, your financial advisors uh, that aren't that don't get special needs planning, they're not talking about this. Uh, Vanguard and Fidelity and Schwab, the do-it-yourself places, the recent college grad on the other end of the phone is not asking them about this because they don't get it. They don't know, uh, which is why I think it's an impossibility to try to, try to navigate what I've coined a three-person retirement, which is mom and dad, your lifetime care your quality of life for the rest of your life, and the quality of life and lifetime care for your son or daughter that could live till they're 90 years old. So if you have an 18-year-old, you, you better be planning for 70 plus years of income that needs to be there to sustain their lifetime care for the rest of their life. Uh, so, you know, that's where a, a lot of mistakes are made, not understanding things uh, from a financial standpoint or a tax planning standpoint on how this has to be done differently and how we have to invest differently, which gets us into the financial side, which is what we do. Wealth management for two generations of income, very different. You don't, you don't invest in an amount of fixed income uh, equal to your age less 100. Um, fixed income in a multi-generational retirement portfolio makes a little sense. You need to approach your insurance planning differently. 
Uncle Sam does not give you a tax break having a child with special needs. Their trust is actually taxed worse than uh, your neurotypical heirs may be. Uh, so these are the things that a, a quality expert in financial planning for families similar to yours will know. We, we, do, we know it because we say the same conversation, even though it's a little bit different, three to four times a day. And we're, everybody's goal is the same. Um, and this is what we promise to our clients. Our priorities are twofold. One is that you, mom or mom and dad, whatever it might be, is that you can have the quality of life that you want. Before retirement, helping out your other children, doing things that you want to do, save the right places, protect if something bad happens, and get to retirement where you can be financially independent and do more fun things in retirement, and most importantly, not run out of money. I think that's everybody's goal that retires someday, is that I can retire and safely not run out of money, but also maximize my income so I'm not uh, sacrificing quality of life just to make sure I don't run out of money. Um, the other goal is your child. We, we, me, need to make sure that your child's quality of life is, and lifetime care needs are taken care of. And I don't know what that means to you. Uh, that's only an answer you can come up with, but we help you quantify it. And our goal is to make sure that there's enough money in your special needs trust when you go to take care of it. And the problem is those two goals directly clash with one another. So it's about, you know, navigating both of them, making sure your, your plans are not only done, but done right. Um, there's a, uh, I mean, look, I, I could talk on this topic for an, an hour. Uh, and just so you know, and I put it in the chat, I don't know if anybody saw it. I have uh, three other special needs planning Zoom workshops coming up over the next three weeks, August 11th at 3 p.m., August 19th at 1 p.m., August 26th at 1 p.m., should you want to tune into those. Or like I said, if you want to talk about things that are unique to your situation, um, feel free to reach out. We can schedule a Zoom meeting to talk about uh, what it is that you want to cover and your situation for your child. And, you know, determined together doesn't make sense to, to go from there. And Pat, we did oh, have I'm a question for you. Sure. Um, so uh, just to confirm, you can't leave more than $2,000 to a child with a disability due to their Medicaid or Medicare benefits. Uh, kind of correct, yes. You cannot, a individual that is on needs-based benefits, which is Medicaid, SSI, waivers, food stamps, Section 8 housing, to keep it simple, cannot have over $2,000 in aggregate resources in their name, which means in their Social Security. So under 18, it works a little bit differently. Over 18, it works differently. Um, so no, they you cannot be investing or saving in their name. Uh, family members can't be buying bonds or brokerage accounts in your child's Social Security number. That's where the special needs trust and in very, very, very limited situations, an ABLE account might make sense. I don't know if I okay. put it up there. And, then, um, and if you have a Go term ahead. life insurance policy, can you leave them money from that policy in a trust? Well, anything you leave to them if you, when you pass away, which hopefully your best plan is don't die till you're 120. You don't have to worry about any of this. But uh, yes, you have to name the trust and the correct verbiage for the trust as the beneficiary of any life insurance. If you have retirement accounts, those have to be worded very specifically or you could screw up some of the favorable tax treatment on, an, on a retirement account. Uh, but a, a pre-tax retirement account is the worst thing you could leave behind to a special needs trust. A 401k, for savings plan, 403b, anything you have not ever paid income taxes on. It gets taxed the worst when it's left to a special needs trust. So, um, yes, naming things as a beneficiary is one point, but it's, you know, is your insurance the right type? Term insurance is great. It serves a purpose. It does not solve the goal of taking care of your child when you pass away because it's temporary. I mean, it can be a component of your plan, but it's something that you need to build off of and look into the role of permanent insurance at some point in the future, if it makes sense. But that's a good question. Thank you. Um, one of the other things I'll throw out there, for those that have 18-year-olds that are not getting the full amount of supplemental security income right now, which is $783 a month, it means that you're making a mistake and not charging them room and board or rent, or it means that you're telling the government you're paying for their meals. Um, you, you can't do any of that or the government's going to automatically reduce that SSI by a third. So guess what? You do have to charge your son or daughter that has a disability room and board. I prefer room and board. It's not taxable as income uh, to make sure you maximize and get the full amount of SSI. And then we can use that money in effective and creative ways to really benefit your child in the future.
Wonderful. Um, we did have one question sent in advance and you may have touched on it, but I want to just read it again to make sure we do cover it. Um, what financial tool has been the most tax efficient for a special needs person and what are some of the legal and financial implications when considering that tool? Well, if you go from tax efficient, which means when, when you want to fund a special needs trust, which for parents on the call, you do not need to put any of your money into a special needs trust or even be saving in your child's uh, ABLE account or anywhere for them while you're alive. Because as long as you're alive, you will, as mom and dad, do everything the special needs trust uh, has the capability of doing. So the special needs trust really, from the parent's standpoint, only needs to be funded at death when you're both gone. So when you focus then on tax efficiency, what's most tax efficient when we die to fund the special needs trust with? It depends on what state you live in. Like Pennsylvania, for example, we have an inheritance tax, which is a 4.5% tax on everything that one owns with the exception of life insurance. But there's a lot of states that don't have inheritance taxes or state estate taxes. So the least tax efficient what, across the board because it's under federal law, like I said, are pre-tax retirement accounts. The most tax efficient across the board when it comes to the federal estate tax is life insurance. Life insurance is not taxed whatsoever. There's no inheritance tax. In, in the states that have it. There's no estate tax. If you are under the threshold, you can have it owned by a trust. If you're over the threshold, you can leave right now $11.5 million to anybody, a special needs trust included, and the government can't take a dime of it. There's nothing else that works that way. Uh, the life insurance would be filed closely by Roth IRAs for sale of taxable investments or sale of real estate. Hopefully that answered that question. Yes, and we do have another that came uh, through. For SSI, is the amount across all the states the same, or does it differ from state to state? For example, uh, Virginia, children with disability don't get SSI, but get the CCC plus waiver and Medicaid. Medicaid and the waiver are completely different than SSI. SSI is a cash benefit that's intended to pay for food, housing, and shelter. Medicaid's health insurance and waiver funds are the ancillary supports and services that individuals get. And they're completely different benefits. You need all three of them. Um, they are not, they are mutually exclusive. Um, the amount of the monthly SSI check, though, some states do supplement the federal amount. And some states do not. I believe the federal amount is the $783 a month. Okay. Maxima. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lauren, I'm going to um, hop in just to remind everyone if you have any additional questions, not only do we have Lisa and Pat and John available for answers, but we also have Jordan, who is um, a special needs teacher, and she's been doing this since, two, since 2011. So she's actually teaching children, and she's, like all of us, you know, figuring out what school is going to look like um for children with uh special needs as well so if there's any questions for any of our panel of ex experts please just send them in to lauren now and and we can um try to address them as best we can and larry we did have one more that was sent in advance that i think everyone will be able to maybe touch on um would choosing virtual learning instead of the proposed hybrid model make it more difficult for my child to receive compensatory education? Can, can you hear me? This is Lisa. Yes. Yes. So that would absolutely be a school district question. They, the family would have to go directly to their school district. And I'm sure maybe John or Jordan could chime in on that as well. Yeah. Um it's it's generally a district by district or county by county issue in terms of that i know a lot of counties in virginia just speaking from an aba point of view are uh, they have their own aba programs in the class or let me rephrase that they have some aba based programs in the classroom um therefore they uh don't necessarily do anything outside but there are private placement options uh, within an IEP where if you can demonstrate that a child is not served uh, adequately through the public school system, then the public school will send the child to a private uh, special education program. That's very difficult to do, though. 
Yeah, and Lauren, if you wouldn't mind repeating that question again, I could probably add to that too. Yes, absolutely. Um, would choosing virtual learning instead of the proposed hybrid model make it more difficult for my child to receive compensatory education? So I'm not really sure about the compensatory time. Um, I know I'm an ABA as well. Um, I know that, you know, a lot of parents are asking my opinion on whether they should be, you know, picking the online option or going, you know, for the in-person. Um, there's no way, especially being an ABA, that we can replicate everything online. It's just, it's a hands-on approach and a lot of modeling. Um, so I don't think it's really a comparison, but I do think that the virtual learning has a huge component where parents now get to see you know what their kids are learning and how they're learning and that modeling has been crucial for a lot of my family so you know i think if they're worried about sending their kids back i totally understand that and as long as they put the time in to you know help their kids virtually and you know maybe pick up some own coaching um on the parents end from teachers and stuff like that i think staying at home is a fine option but um being in school and getting that hands-on learning is definitely you know, what we would aim for the kids to do. And to, to add in a little bit further, especially regarding, um, you know, when selecting different programs, especially at an IEP time, um, and what's going to be most effective, as Jordan said, um, you know, nothing can really, truly 100% replicate um, sitting there at the table together or sitting there in the classroom together. Um, but there really is no model at this point for us to base the current situation on in terms of what different school options will be, um, whether there will be more openness to private placements for medically fragile children if schools go back or what the case may be where, you know, at least uh, I can only speak for myself, but unfortunately in this situation, I'm learning right along with you. And um, everyone, we do, this is our, our, we do have one more question. Um, it's our last question. Uh, do you have a list of ideas for accommodations in a virtual learning environment? Yes. Um, and that's <laughs> something that, uh, that uh, it's not, it's not necessarily something that I could just like rattle off um, a long list right now. But a virtual learning environment, whether it be one-on-one -on -one ABA services or things that a child may need to help support them to sit at the computer and stay engaged through a, a school-based thing, that's something that I'd be glad to talk to anyone about sort of on a case-by-case a -case basis. Um, you know, it's all about determining what's going to work for this kid in that situation. What what is going to keep their interest? Because um, the hardest thing in certain situations about a virtual learning, distance learning is keeping focus on there. And a lot of what I've been working on over the last several months is just that, keeping focus. And you know, whoever submitted that question, I'd be glad to talk to them in, in further depth about that specific situation and maybe come up with it. But like I said, I don't have a catch-all. I can send you their information, John. Thanks. Okay. Lauren, is that the last question that you have then? That's it. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone that was on the call tonight um, for taking the time. It definitely, you know, you can see your level of dedication to your children. I would really like to thank our entire panel of experts for taking the time tonight. I know. At least one of them, Lisa, was without power today. <laughs> so, um, so whatever it takes. And um, I also just want to remind everyone that you know we're here. We're trying to gather these types of um, experts in different areas to bring to you what you need um, during these times. Um, this is a, a different time for all of us, and we'll. As John had said, we're all learning as we go, and we all know it takes a village. So 
please um, take the time to fill out the survey. Let us know what else you'd like information on. And we'll try to seek that out to bring you that information. Um, we also had um, a couple of weeks ago a peaceful parenting webinar. And next week we have a Keeping the Calm, which we're going to be talking about sleep, diet, and general anxiety. Um, we are videotaping all of these webinars, and we'll have a YouTube library that you know uh, anyone can access at any point. The other plans are for a back to school, whatever that looks like, um, to give you some of those ideas. I know that um, that we just had a question on that. So um, we all know it takes a village. Uh, let us know what you need, and we will try our very best to pull it together for you. And um, we just really appreciate um, you being on. It really shows, you know, the level of care that you have. And I, once again, would like to thank our entire panel of experts tonight. Today made it a challenge for some of us, and we really appreciate it. So everyone have a great night, and we will see you hopefully next week. Hi, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.